This week, Donald Trump announced a revolutionary tax cut for the United States, but is he its biggest beneficiary? I'll ask renowned economist and former advisor to Ronald Reagan and to Trump, Arthur Laffer. And we'll also debate whether Rwanda is turning into a dictatorship. Laffer, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, you've advised Donald Trump on his tax plan in the past, a plan this administration has called the biggest tax cut in history and that you've been full of praise for. You've said Trump is phenomenal for the US economy. Uh, given this is an administration stuffed with millionaires and billionaires and led by a self-proclaimed billionaire, is it any wonder that theirs is seen as a tax cut of the rich, by the rich, for the rich, that so many tax experts are saying this is a tax cut for the 1%, not for the poor, blue-collar, working-class voters who Trump was supposed to champion? I don't think that's a correct depiction whatsoever. But I think it's trying to make everyone millionaires, billionaires, and trillionaires. I mean, this is a plan to get everyone to economic growth and give everyone a shot at the, uh, at the apple. I mean, this is a place to get economic growth, to take people off the welfare rolls, to put them on the income rolls, and to really create American prosperity, much the way we did with President Ronald Reagan and uh, the way it was done with President Jack Kennedy as well and President Bill Clinton, whom I supported all the way as well. President Clinton didn't do a tax cut like this, but President Trump says this tax cut won't benefit him personally. Quote, it's not good for me, believe me, he said. But why should we believe him? Apart from the fact that he's a pathological liar, to quote your friend, Republican, <laughs> oh, to, quote, to quote your friend, Republican <laughs> Senator Ted Cruz, uh, unlike every president since <laughs> oh, Jimmy goodness. Carter, Trump has refused to release his tax returns. So we don't know what he's liable for, and a lot of people think he's hiding something. Uh, they can think whatever they want, Mehdi. I haven't seen his tax return, and I really have no desire to see it whatsoever, to be honest. Okay, well, a lot of people do have a desire because they want to know if he's giving himself a big tax cut. Let's be clear with what we do sure. know. Let's be clear with what we do know, Art Laffer, based on this week's tax cut plan. Number one, President Trump has had to pay tens of millions of dollars in the past in the form of the alternative minimum tax, the AMT. And number two, Trump's wealth, which he says is a lot, uh, would be subject to the estate tax upon his death. So what is his tax plan? do it gets rid of the AMT and it gets rid of the estate tax win-win for Trump win-win for Trump's rich friends now very honestly most people in the level of wealth of Donald Trump don't pay estate taxes anyways Medi they have all sorts of lawyers and accountants and get rid of it the the tax codes are full of loopholes to get around that so I don't know what his tax planning has been but most of the rich people uh, will not be affected by the estate that, tax that is not correct they really won't be. Uh, on the on the AMT Trump we know because a 2005 no, I, tax return was leaked paid some more than 30 million dollars thanks to the AMT without the AMT no, he benefits by 30 million dollars at least no, let me just say this about that, if I can. They're also eliminating the state and local tax deduction. Now, I haven't done the calculations for Trump's personal returns, and I don't have any desire to do it either. But getting rid of state and local tax deductions would hurt him a lot. But getting rid of the AMT will help him. I don't know what the net balance is, but so all of these So you're kind of contradicting things, yourself. I, you're saying you don't know what the net balance is, but you don't want to know. You don't want to see the tax return. That's the only way we will know. We only know he paid AMT. I don't AMT. care about Trump. You don't I, care, I care that about, the president care, of the United States is a, it might be giving himself millions of dollars in tax cuts at the expense no, not, of others? No, I, I don't wow. care as long as he helps everyone else. The corporate tax rate reduction will increase employment output and production, brings jobs back home from abroad. It's a huge plus. Now, if you go through the econometric models and uh, all the okay. logic of this and all the studies, it shows the corporate tax rate reduction will have a huge impact on okay. U.S. output, employment, and So the and corporate wages. tax cut that you mentioned, just for the sake of our viewers watching around That's the world. My big it's That's my big thing. Yes, one. it is your big thing. It's down from 30 25% is a proposal to 20%. You wanted 15. Trump, I believe, wanted 15. That's he true. wants to do that, though, at a time when corporate profits as a share of GDP in the U.S. are higher than they've ever been, have risen dramatically since 2000, and corporate tax payments are a smaller share of GDP than they were several decades ago. Why do it now? Corporations are already sitting on lots of cash, making lots of cash, but hey, let's give them more money. 
Well, no, it's not giving them money. It's giving them incentives to make profits. In They're the already so making they record people. profits. They're already sitting on yes, cash piles. So is that really the place you want to direct your tax no, but what, 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 what you really want to do, if I may, Betty, is you don't want them to make their money by tax shelters and evasion and avoidance and having companies go abroad. What you want to do is make them have the incentive to increase investments, output, employment, and production, which is exactly what this plan does. The reason we have such low corporate tax revenues is because we have the highest tax rate in the world, oh, not in come spite on. of. You know that's yes. only true on paper. As you yourself said moments ago, most of these rich people use loopholes and deductions to get out of it. You know very well that the effective corporate tax rate yes. in the U.S. is around 18, 19 percent lower it's than what lower Trump than wants that. to reduce it's it. Even lower than that. So then, so then, it's even lower so than that. So then why are you but pretending the that some disincentive because to corporations because investing? Do you know why it's low? Do you know why it's low? It's because corporations find it attractive and valuable to hire lawyers, accountants, deferred income specialists to shelter that income instead of paying the taxes. But if you drop the rate, they won't find it worthwhile and they'll pay their darn taxes. Well, let's look at the companies that already are paying very little tax. You would accept there are a lot of companies, as you just said. Exxon, GE, exactly. Guys, yes. GE gets a rebate in some years. They, they, they play zero. I know. Isn't that amazing? Shocking. And yet, companies like those, when you look at the studies that were done this year, plenty of, you talked about economic models, plenty of studies have shown those corporations have not been increasing jobs. Despite the fact they've had no corporate tax bill, it hasn't oh translated into higher jobs. A lot of experts agree that cutting corporation tax rates just boosts shareholder profits, dividends, bonuses. It doesn't translate into higher jobs. You've seen those studies. You don't have to agree with them, but you know oh, there are course, a lot of no, studies no. out there. But I know, the, I know the studies better than anyone. This is my I'm field. Sure I've done true. a complete summary. Well, it is true. And I can just tell you the preponderance of ever information is that the corporate tax rate reduction is the thump of adrenaline into the heart of the economy and will increase output growth, production, employment. Just look at across the board. Why did all those countries in the OECD from 2000 till today, every single country except for the U.S. and Hungary in the OECD, has has dropped their corporate tax rates dramatically. We were and, the and, seventh and, highest and, and in and 2000, the, and now we're the highest. And in that same period, and the US getting, has had record job expansion. The corporate tax has not hurt job growth. Under Barack Obama, there was oh, baloney, record baloney, job baloney, expansion. That's, that's not true. It is true. Obama was a terrible economy. Hold on, hold on. That's hold on. Why Are you saying that's that's why the had Democrats record won job the election? expansion in recent years? You're just denying the official figures. Of course it's not true. We have wow. not. We had okay. much better expansion under Kennedy and under Reagan. Oh, we're not comparing to Kennedy, under Kennedy. we're comparing to the rest of the world. You said the other countries in the world dropped their corporate tax rates and got job growth. I'm saying America, without doing that, got job growth. So your theory doesn't hold that if you cut taxes, oh, you get lots true. of new jobs. Why do all these countries do it? And why did the American voters throw the Democrats out? Because they were so okay. happy with what they Let's did. Look at, no, they okay, so you're, you're, It's because they didn't work. Fine. They didn't work Let's well. Let's look at the evidence. And that's why we're... Why did they all cut tax rates in the OECD? Did they do it to get worse? Okay. I interviewed you a couple of years ago, and we talked about Kansas. In 2012, just for the sake of our global audience, some background, you and Kansas oh Republican governor. And then, oh, my goodness. Let me just say the point, and then you respond. You and Kansas Republican <laughs> governor Sam Brownback came up with a tax plan for Kansas, which many people say Donald Trump has, has borrowed from, modeled his model on. In Kansas, it's been a disaster. It's led to a budget deficit, cuts in school funding, insufficient tax revenues. It was so bad that in June of this year, a Republican-led state legislature rolled back that tax plan, brought in tax rises. Your tax experiment in Kansas, in the real, forget the studies, in the real world, we tried what you say, and it was, it was a failure. There are 50 states in this country. I've done lots of work with lots of states. Prop 13 oh, in California, God, what's you happening really in Tennessee. just going to pretend Kansas, Kansas doesn't is, exist? Let's talk about oh, the no, other Kansas 49. Does exist, look over but there. I, did, I didn't do that. That was Sam Brownback's plan. Oh, and wow. I did think it was a good plan. Oh, come on. Now, every wow, come every on. economics journalist and economist knows that you were the main advisor to Sam Brownback on that plan. Sam Brownback has identified you as part of that plan. Are you saying you had nothing to do with that plan? Or are you saying the plan no. was good? Which no, bit are you I, I thought the plan. I thought the plan was good, but Sam Brownback did that plan. I didn't. I came in after he had announced his plan. But that's okay. Yeah, I think Sam Brownback's plan did help Kansas in there. Kansas has lots of other things going on: agricultural prices <laughs> falling, oil prices falling, and all of that. I but think your answer the big, that big it was a disaster. No, wait a second. Now, the big, the big test here is because of Sam Brownback's plan, Missouri cut its tax rate by 10 percent across the board in response so that they wouldn't lose all the jobs to Kansas. If, flat, if, if emulation isn't the biggest form of flattery, I don't know what is. Well, if Republicans, Republicans rolling back your tax plan isn't evidence that it's a failure, I don't know what is. You said to me in 2014, give it more time. You didn't disown it then. You said, give it more time, it'll be great. Just oh, like no. you're saying now about <laughs> Trump's tax plan. Your predictions didn't work then. They're not going to work now is what many would say. Oh, well, that many would be wrong. Are you saying it was a bad plan, nothing to do with you, or you still think it was a good plan and you don't buy that it led to a budget deficit, uh, tax revenues falling, education spending being cut? 
I will tell you exactly. The plan that Sam Brownback had was a good plan. I thought it would be good for Kansas, and that is not the plan the legislature's passed that he finally signed, and I did not have anything to do with the writing of that plan, although I did think it was a good plan, and I thought it would do a lot of good, and I still think it did do good. Okay, okay. there okay. you go. Okay, to be fair to you, Art Laffer, you've never claimed to be a deficit hawk or a balanced budget obsessive, but both Donald Trump and almost all Republican members of Congress have claimed to be at some stage or another. They were all up in arms yes, over the size of the deficit and the debt, as you know, under Barack Obama. So isn't it now yes. complete hypocrisy on their part to be supporting a Trump tax plan, which according to non-partisan tax experts, will add $2.2 trillion <laughs> net to the debt over the next 10 years? Well, first place, those plans are, those models are wrong. But I would like to say, those I don't know of a politician. Models. I understand they are. Uh, I don't know of a politician who's not hypocritical, to be honest with you, anywhere in the world. That's their nature. They're born that way. You and I can agree on kind of deficits. All I'm saying is at a time when the economy is already growing, jobs are already growing. It's not a recession as it was under George W. Bush's tax cut or under Ronald Reagan's tax cut. You, you know, the, bank, uh, the Federal Reserve threatening to raise interest rates. Uh, nearly four dozen economists told the National Association for Business Economics recently that growth won't reach the 3% that Trump claims that you suggest will happen. But they're, they're all, four dozen economists are wrong okay. on that. Everybody's but let me wrong. just say, the models no, are wrong, the economists no, are wrong, the history is wrong, Kansas is wrong. No, 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 only the ones you cite are wrong, not okay. all of them. You haven't cited the vast majority. Yet. Well, I cited all the literature on that, on the growth there. What's you can find it in the academic literature. Have you, I mean, all of it, including the, the, Democrats. America, the Walmart United States right now? Cuts. Can you point to anyone who says right now that the U.S. is going to hit 3 4% growth with a model, a published study? Oh, I think there will be a lot. You could look at my published studies, by the way. Okay, you, you can't quote yourself. And, <laughs> I'll laugh at what I asked for a reference Why not? Study. Okay, fine. Why not? I've got my PhD. Like, I've been a professor all my life. That's not what I mean. And I you, cite okay. all the, I cite all the articles there and all the growth. I mean, but let me just say that the growth under Reagan, when we did the cuts from January 1st, 83, to June 30th, 84, the growth during that 18-month period was 12% in real terms or an annual rate of 8% compounded annually. It was same thing was under Kennedy with the go-go 60s, same thing under Harding and Coolidge, and the same thing under Bill Clinton, all of them following my models. You were one of the few people who predicted a Donald Trump election victory last year. Oh, you... I thought I was the worst predictor. No, no, on, on, on politics you were good, maybe not on economics. Oh, good, thank you. You predicted oh, okay, a good. Donald you, Trump Eddie. election victory <laughs> uh, perfectly spot on last year. You've supported him yeah, pretty you. much ever since. I just wonder, as a leading economist and a conservative voice for several decades now, a former advisor to President Reagan, among others, how does someone like yourself persuade yourself to support, to back a president who attacks NFL players for peacefully protesting racism while calling neo-Nazi protesters very fine people, who attacks a news anchor for saying she's bleeding from her face, goes golfing almost every mm. weekend, calls news organizations like ours the enemies of the people, lies about the size of the crowd at his inauguration, lies about the number of votes he received, lies about what's in his health care bill, lies about Obama wiretapping his phones, lies about, uh, you know, st tries to start a nuclear oh war with nuclear North Korea on Twitter. How does someone, a smart, educated, serious person such as yourself, back a man like that? Can I just tell you, I was in the White House from 1970 to 72. I was on the first trip to China in the October of 1970. Which is why I I'm wondering how you all. can support this guy. I I've been around 77 years on this planet, and I plan to be around for a lot more, so I plan a lot more discussions with you, but I've seen it all, and I think any type of singling out one president as being the worst of all bad and hypocritical in every regard and all this stuff is nonsense. They've all had their pluses and their minuses, but frankly, on economics, this guy is very good and will do a good job, and you'll see America prosper as a result. That is my opinion right as of the president. And you trust him on the economy. You trust him. You trust Donald Trump on so the economy. So far, I trust the legislation. I don't trust anyone until it's done. And I see this legislation going through, and once it's passed, I think it will be terrific. Terrific for America and for the rest of the world. Besides, by the way, no one is better off with a weak America. No one is. Art Laffer, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you very much. It's fun to do, be with you again. It's 16 years since the U.S. began its war in Afghanistan, and President Trump now wants to escalate it. In this week's Reality Check, Upfront producer Kieran Alvey examines the real cost of the never-ending war against the Taliban. 16 years gone, more than one trillion U.S. dollars spent and over 30,000 civilian deaths. Yet, U.S. President Donald Trump wants to spend more time and more money in Afghanistan, even though he said himself in 2015. 
Now, at some point, are they going to be there for the next 200 years? You know, at some point, what's going on? And it's a mess. So how bad of a mess did the U.S. really make? For one, it wasted billions. A U.S. government study found the United States contributed mightily to the problems in Afghanistan by dumping too much money with too little oversight. And how much money? Well, one investigation found the U.S. squandered $17 billion on countless badly researched and poorly strategized projects. Like fighting the opium trade, since 2002, the U.S. has spent $8.5 billion on counter-narcotics efforts, and yet there has been a 43% increase in opium production. Or take agriculture. The U.S. spent millions of dollars to persuade Afghans to farm and eat soybeans. Only research already showed they're hard to grow and Afghans don't like them. A $34 million preventable failure. Meanwhile, what happened to the Taliban? Well, the group went from being completely driven out of the country just two months after the U.S.-led invasion in 2001 to today controlling or contesting nearly 40% of Afghanistan. What went wrong? A lot of things. But one fundamental factor was that even though Taliban governance is not something most Afghans wish for, many found it more tolerable than the misgovernance, power abuse and corruption they face from the state. Can you blame them? Since the U.S.-led invasion, poverty, unemployment, underemployment, violence, outmigration, internal displacement and the education gender gap have all increased. And so have civilian casualties. Is it any wonder Afghans make up the second highest number of refugees in the world today? Despite all these consequences, the U.S. now wants to spend more money again, send more troops again, and let the military operate with even less micromanagement from Washington to continue trying to defeat the Taliban. They may just be there for 200 years after all. Rwandan President Paul Kagame was re-elected in August for the third time with nearly 99% of the vote. He'll serve another seven-year term till 2024 and with the constitution amended could theoretically stay on in power till 2034. While many have praised Kagame for reviving Rwanda after its brutal genocide, especially its economy, others have become increasingly concerned that the president and former rebel leader is turning the country into a dictatorship. Joining me in the arena to debate this are David Himbara, a former advisor to Paul Kagame, who now lives in exile and has become a fierce critic of the Rwandan leader, and in Kigali, Getete Niringabo, a senior fellow at the Institute of Policy Analysis and Research and a supporter of the government. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Um, Getete, let me start with you. President Kagame was re-elected in August with nearly 99% of the vote. That's the kind of victory that Saddam Hussein used to get. It's the kind of victory that would make Kim Jong-un blush. No, listen. If it was up to me to allocate percentages of votes, I would have given him, what, 65, 70, 80, 90? I don't okay. know. But it's not something that people decide. It's what happened. Why, why did it happen? Because why would people not vote for him? Uh, people never ask these questions. Why would people not vote for him? What's the example? Would they want to be like Burundi, like Kenya? You know the jury is still out in Kenya now, like DRC. So they, they, they voted for him like to maintain stability. Or like the United States. I mean, you have to look at what other votes have happened thus far and look at what results they've given. Okay. Uh, well, let me bring in uh, David Himbaro, who's here with me in the studio. David, whether it was 99%, 90%, 80%, whatever, the point is Kagame won a landslide victory. He is a popular, charismatic president. Whether you like him or not, you can't deny the fact that many, many Rwandans do like him. Elections assume uh, independence institutions, judiciary, the parliament. Uh, so in this case, you have a president that appoints the judiciary, appoints and fires. So he is king of Rwanda. Okay. So I would be surprised if he didn't get, actually, I'm surprised that he didn't get 100%. <laughs> Maybe yeah. next time. Uh, Getete, he's the king of Rwanda, says David. Doesn't sound very democratic. Right, so we've enjoyed 23 years. For the first time in the history, in the post-independence history of Rwanda, it's the first time we've enjoyed 23 years of uninterrupted peace and stability. That means he still enjoys uh, the support of the people. But do you believe the presidential election, Getete, was a free and fair election? I was here. I went to vote. Of course I do. 
because the U.S. State and, Department and said we are disturbed by irregularities observed during voting. We reiterate long-standing concerns over the integ integrity and transparency of the process. What does that mean, Maisie? What, what it means they're not I, happy with the way what, the election happened and the 99 percent result. They're not happy, Maisie. If people are not happy, they say we observed this fact, we observed this incident. Observe that. Not being happy is not something we can control. Well, There's they say no they, they say they observed irregularities. But let me just put this point to David. Yeah. You used to be a close advisor of Paul Kagame. You worked with him. Yes. So who changed over the years? He changed or you changed? Let me put it this way. 2010, which is when I left, hmm. is a year that changed the entire equation in Rwanda. Opposition leader killed. Media people killed. Uh, attempted assassinations of people who fled. Everything that could go ugly went ugly. And that's when I left. That was not me. Previous to that, it, uh, it, we, it, it was uh, authoritarian, but not that open violence, mm -hmm. really. So that's what made me leave. Kitete, yes. It's indisputable, isn't it, that in recent years, Rwanda's come under heavy criticism from human rights groups such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, for its human rights record. Even the United States government, close ally of Rwanda, big donor to Rwanda, said in its 2016 State Department report, the most important human rights problems in Rwanda were government harassment, arrest and abuse of political opponents, restrictions on media freedom, arbitrary killings, torture. Sounds pretty awful. Yes. So I will give you an example of uh, Human Rights Watch, for instance. Human Rights Watch just published a report that says people who steal cows and goats in Rwanda are supposed to be shot. And what they also say is that this is Kagame's direct orders <laughs> to, to shoot uh, thieves and, and that kind of thing. First of all, these people didn't steal Kagame's cows. Second, we don't even know if this is true. And third, who in his right mind, even people who committed the genocide, okay. have been released and let to go in with, their homes? With respect, their, you, don't, you don't like Human Rights Watch, but I didn't quote Human Rights Watch. I quoted the United States government, close ally of the Rwandan government, which said restrictions on media freedom, arbitrary killings, torture, uh, government harassment, arrest of political opponents. Are they lying? Are they making it up? Why would they do that? They're friends of yours. I wonder why they didn't say faking the moon landing and so on. Maybe you're giving me broad st statements. Give me facts. Tell me X was killed, Y was David, there's, 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 David, it's all, it's, it's not specific. It's too vague. He's not accepting. What do you say to that? Where, where do I begin? Attempted assassination of Kayumba Nyamwasa in South Africa. That ended up in court. The people who were hired to kill this man were sentenced to jail. But the court, the judge said, that he's sending the wrong people to jail. Okay. The people that should be sent to jail are his, the masters who sent him from Rwanda. From Rwanda. That's a record. Britain, Scotland Yard warned Rwandans, uh, Rwandan, uh, uh, that they were being targeted for assassination. Yeah, uh, so uh, as, in, as you live abroad. In Sweden. You live abroad, you're yeah. a critic of Rwanda. Yes. Do you ever fear for your own life? No, yes. Of course, Canadian uh, uh, security organs have to, take an, to keep an eye on me. Everyone who is opposed to this regime, mm. especially the outspoken ones, they are targets. Kateta, do, yes. you, do, you, do, do you dispute the fact that a lot of Rwandan exiles, especially critics of Kagame, have ended up either dead or almost dead? I, I dispute this uh, for the following reasons. So there's only one man who died who, who was called uh, Karege, and then there's Kayumba Nyamwasa whose attempt, uh, whose, who, whose ass attempt assassinations have been established. Now, in both cases, there was never any evidence linking, linking these people who did these things to, uh, to, to the Rwandan government. There was never evidence. We are almost out of time. I want to ask a question about the future. One final question to both of you. Uh, Gatete, thanks to a change in the constitution, Paul Kagame could now serve as president theoretically till 20. 34. He's already been president for 17 years. Do you really think Rwandans want, need, should have another 17 years of the same president? Really? For now, if you ask me today, I think yes. I'll tell you why. They are just like German people. They look around Europe, they look around the world, they see there's a global leadership crisis. They say, listen, we have a boon here. We're not going to let these people go. So if you ask me as of today, we'll talk about that in the next seven years. But as of today, 
Rwandan people are just like German people. Like everyone who's having a, an exceptional leader amid a global leadership crisis. Why would Rwandan people let Kagame go if they see what's happening in Kenya right now, in the DRC, in Burundi, in, uh, in, uh, and so on? David, final question. Do you think Kagame will still be around come 2034? I think he'll be around 77 then. Yes, he will, he will be. Uh, at least that's what he plans. And we, we know from the Constitution why he wants to hang on. In the, in the change of the Constitution, they have uh, Article 114, which says that a former head of state may not be charged or prosecuted for crimes, including treason, committed while in office. So you think he's staying on in power to protect himself? Absolutely. And, and this clause that he hopes, so he'll stay in, and then beyond the clause, he, he thinks that well, uh, that will, will, will protect him. If we're all but of course, knowing the history of Rwanda, each leader who came, came violently, and he, lo he, he left violently. Well, I, I don't anticipate okay. any being different. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.